No bloco de notas de hoje, nós continuamos com nossa série de entrevistas em parceria com a Escola de Verão em Química da UFRESCAR, que em 2020 completa a sua 40ª edição. E o nosso convidado de hoje é o professor Thiel Opatz, da Johannes Gutenberg Universität, na Alemanha. Professor, thank you very much for your time, for being here with us. It's an honor. You're welcome. Here at the summer school, you are giving a, min, uh, a course and uh, also a lecture that talks uh, about heterocycles. To begin with, I would like you to explain what are heterocycles and uh, what applications do they have? Mm. So actually, um, heterocycles are a very um, large and important class of chemical compounds. Um, the word hetero means that those compounds are not only, those are organic compounds, so carbon-based, but the word hetero symbolizes that there are also other elements than just carbon and hydrogen contained, namely um, oxygen, sulfur, and most notably nitrogen is contained in, uh, in the typical heterocycles uh, that we find. And it can be uh, stated that heterocycles are actually the chemistry of life. If you imagine DNA, DNA is made up of, of uh, individual uh, pieces that contain two heterocycles uh, uh, linked to each other. One containing oxygen, it's a sugar, and the other one is called a, a nucleobase, and this is uh, containing nitrogen. And also other heterocycles that are well known to the general public are probably chlorophyll, Uh, then uh, the heme, the, the, the red color uh, of blood, uh, is, a, is a, an iron-containing uh, nitrogen heterocycle. Uh, caffeine is a heterocycle. Cocaine is a heterocycle. So there are many, many biological, uh, um, biologically active molecules uh, that are heterocycles. And um, to me, it is hard to imagine how uh, life could evolve without involving heterocyclic structures. And in fact, what we have on our planet is based on heterocycles. Hence, heterocyclic chemistry is also part of the language of life. We are talking, and uh, your research is uh, about natural products and also bioactive compounds. I imagine that people can think, uh, okay, if they, they are natural uh, products, mm. they are already there and around us. So. What are we talking about when we say we do uh, the synthesis of natural products? Why is it important? Yeah. Um, there are several aspects of the, of the synthesis of natural products. First, uh, it is important to train students. To train students and, and to train scientists to be able to assemble molecules that nature has evolved. But there is uh, many instances where you, uh, in, in, in which you want to, let's say, communicate with biological systems. For instance, uh, you want to design a, a medication, a drug that uh, uh, works against a certain disease. Then you have to speak the, the language of, of nature, and which is uh, also the, the, the language of natural products, often heterocycles, as already mentioned. But um, if you want to influence biological systems, you have to be sort of on the same, on the same level of structures. So uh, you can, of course, argue that those compounds are already there. They are already known. They are already existing in nature, but maybe not in the quantities you may need them. There's famous examples, for instance, where co uh, compounds, natural products, are found in very small quantity in plants that are almost extinct. They are very rare or grow in, in spots like in, uh, they, the natural products may be found in, in sponges or marine organisms, uh, the harvesting of which is just not possible in, 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 in the quantities you will need those compounds for scientific investigations, but also for the treatment of diseases. So um, it can be um, um, stated that roughly half of the, the medications, the drugs that we are using at the moment, are either natural products themselves, derived from natural products, or inspired by natural products. So um, they, they play a very important role, and due to uh, ecological constraints, uh, it uh, can be very uh, uh, important to have a synthetic access. Moreover, if you want to make variations of the structure in order to, let's say, prolong half-life, um, so if you, if you want to have medication, it's of no use if it leaves your body within minutes. 
or is degraded in the bloodstream. So what you want is a compound that acts over several hours in order to help you. Um, so you might need to introduce modifications into the molecules, which is not that easy if you start from the natural source. Uh, you could think that um, you could modify, of course, genetically modify organisms in order to produce variations, but there are modifications that nature simply doesn't make, like the introduction of fluorine, for instance. Very rarely nature does this. Um, and this, but this turned out to be the key to many successful drugs that are on the market now and also agrochemicals. So it is important to, uh, to be able to make variations and uh, thus uh, we need to be able to do this and, um, uh, and also to provide the compounds reliably on a, um, uh, on a multi-ton scale or even a hundred thousand ton scale. Uh, if desired, if, if such compounds like vanillin, for instance. There's simply not enough vanilla in the world to make everything that we want, want to have vanilla flavor to, to give it vanilla flavor, right? So we can uh, either cultivate the orchid anywhere in the world where it grows, but even that would not be sufficient. So we have to be able to, uh, to make this natural product vanillin synthetically, which is absolutely identical in all respects to, to, to natural vanillin and uh, poses no, no health risk. Um, so this is the kind of chemistry we're looking at. Okay. Now, uh, talking about uh, a greener chemistry, uh, the, the problem with fossil fuels is known for most people. But uh, what I think that uh, many people don't know is that uh, many raw materials in industry, in the chemical industry and in other industries, also come from uh, fossil sources. Yes. So I would like you to, to talk a bit about it and also about what chemistry is trying to do or is doing to, to face this challenge. Yeah, so, so actually um, chemistry has not always been based on, uh, on fossil fuels or on fossil carbon sources. Um, there were times where uh, simply this, this um, chemistry had not been developed and it was not known how to, uh, to extract the valuable compounds from, from fossil resources. But natural products made, made the beginning. Compounds uh, that had an, uh, a certain smell like, like vanillin or had certain biological activity like morphine were identified uh, by, by mankind. And then um, chemists started to work with these compounds in the beginning. But then came the age of, of coal and coal tar. So, uh, during the production of, uh, um, of a certain type of gas for, for, for lighting purposes and heating purposes. Um, coal tar was produced from, from coal during the production of coke. Uh, and, 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 and this coal tar was a smelly substance, was really unpleasant, nobody know, uh, know, uh, knew what to do with it. Uh, and then came chemists and could convert this, this, uh, this waste product, this coal tar, into uh, valuable uh, compounds like uh, dye stuffs. Movein was the, the first example, was a, was a bright uh, purple um, color that could be produced from this uh, ugly tar. Uh, and uh, eventually came um, drugs, medications against fever that were also produced from this. And this eventually switched to petroleum in, let's say, uh, around 100, 100 uh, maybe a hundred years ago. This, the whole thing switched from coal tar to, to petroleum, where we are still now. And the chemi chemical industry, organic chemicals, which uh, are the largest fraction, I would say, um, are mostly based, or almost exclusively based, on, uh, on, on petroleum nowadays, or natural gas, which is also a fossil resource. And the question is, how can we change that? Because obviously, uh, um, the resources are not infinitely available. There will be an end. There will be a point called peak oil, where the, from which on the oil production will go down, will um, be reduced over time because the, just the resources are no longer there. And another aspect, of course, is uh, what do we do with the atmosphere? Because everything that we, uh, we consume uh, eventually ends up in the form of carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere, increases CO2 levels, uh, greenhouse effect, global warming, those are just uh, several issues. So 
it would be highly desirable, and this is also uh, an important part of research here at this university, how uh, it is possible to circumvent this problem that is uh, um, uh, an important one. It's debatable how, uh, um, how quickly things, uh, things develop to a, uh, to, a, to a bad situation, but nevertheless, we have to find, as scientists, we have to find answers to that. And thus, um, we would like to find sustainable ways of producing things, producing valuable uh, chemicals, dye stuffs, polymers, um, uh, uh, drugs, uh, uh, performance, uh, other performance chemicals for electronics, let's say, for display uh, applications, liquid crystal displays. Can we make them from renewables? Can we make them from, uh, from a cornfield or from wood? Which would be highly desirable because then the whole carbon is uh, in, a, in, a, in a cyclic uh, movement and we don't just enrich the, the biosphere of the planet with more carbon that we dig from the ground. But I understand that uh, uh, greener chemistry is not only about carbon or about petroleum. Yes. It has to do also with the yes. toxicity and with yes. other compounds. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you to talk a little bit more about it. Why is it important yeah. to think about a green chemistry nowadays? Mm -hmm. And also about the responsibilities of the science. In the past, what, for example, uh, scientists from the chemistry field have already done and uh, why they have to, to think about it, and what now they can do thinking in a better future. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the field of, uh, of green chemistry is more than just the, um, the resources. Where does the carbon come from? But we also have to make sure that the processes that are run don't harm the environment so that we, we get cleaner production. Even, uh, even though we use petroleum, we may use less petroleum, maybe if the process is more efficient. That's one thing. Secondly, wh what are the ingredients that we need to, to, to run our chemistry? Where do they come from? Um, for instance, uh, I, I just uh, gave the example this morning in, the, uh, in, 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 my, um, in my short course. Um, platinum group metals, 95% of the world resources of platinum group metals are based in South Africa. It's their business model to dig them out, to, to, uh, to sell them to the world, of course, but first of all, they are expensive and they are getting increasingly more expensive over time. And uh, also those resources are not uh, uh, available for all times. So the question is, what can we do to develop um, processes that don't need such resources. Cobalt is, a, is another issue for, for lithium-ion batteries. Uh, it's it's uh, quite, important and quite an important uh, strategic element. Uh, main production, as far as I know, is from Congo. And there are political issues there. There are uh, social economical issues there uh, with the production. So if we can get away from that, and we already heard some uh, very interesting talks on, on, on this topic here in the, uh, in the meeting in the summer school, um, if we can uh, develop new processes that don't make use of such uh, kinds of, of, of critical resources, that can be very fruitful. Um, and as you mentioned, the um, responsibilities of scientists, of course, we are part of the society. We are not, you know, we are, uh, um, of course, the experts that have have to develop this, but it's, it's our own uh, interest, of course, to, uh, to develop things that are more sustainable and more green and uh, give a better acceptance. I come from Germany, and in Germany, the acceptance, the generally acceptance, uh, general acceptance of chemistry is not too high. So people say, okay, we need it, we know, but it's, it's uh, uh, maybe if we can substitute or we don't want to have chemicals anywhere, but everything, everything is, chemical, is chemical, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is something that they don't understand, but if you tell them there's atoms somewhere, it's, oh no, atoms, yeah, that's dangerous. Um, th this is a, 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 an issue we have to face and we have to uh, adapt to. And certainly the, the long-term analysis of if we implement a technology nowadays, what will happen in 10, 50, 100 years or, or even longer with the products we make or what are, are long-term effects of our, of our uh, activities? 
This is now, I think, a lot more, or has come, come a lot more to the, to the minds of the people involved, including politicians, um, than it was in the past. In the past, it was just a necessity, uh, uh, let's say, to feed the population, uh, which is still uh, very, uh, very important, but not because of overall production capacity, but rather of the distribution thing. And, and also, um, there's, uh, there's other aspects which um, may have long-term consequences. Release of chlorofluorocarbons. You, you remember the ozone hole story. Fortunately, as it has been recognized that those compounds destroy the ozone layer, they have been banned. Some countries may not, uh, may not adhere to all rules, so it has been found out by NASA recently that some countries are still releasing large amounts of those uh, chemicals in the atmosphere. Uh, but if, if you ban them, uh, if you control them, this problem will be solved in the, in the next decades. Uh, there will be no, uh, uh, no long-term consequences. Of course, there's other technologies which produce things that have longer half-lives, nuclear waste, for instance, and those are things that have to be uh, uh, certainly looked into. And I think nowadays the... Um, Society is much more well informed about what is going on, which is also important. That helps us as well, as scientists, because um, if there's not enough communication, and hence I'm, I'm uh, also very thankful for that interview, which is part of the, our responsibility to, to share what we're doing and to explain why we are doing it. Um, um, otherwise, we would... Uh, sort of be in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a separate situation. We always have to explain why we use taxpayers' money, for what do we use it. And this, uh, um, this general understanding, I think, is a, 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 has become a lot uh, better in the past, although um, also the criticism of technology is still there, especially in, 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 in countries like Germany. Okay, now I have a last question I've asked your colleagues too, and that is, how have you first met science? What was your first experience with scientific knowledge? And uh, how have you decided to be a scientist, or how have you become a scientist? That's a very interesting question. I have, I have, uh, I think I, I have never been asked before. But thank you, this is a, a very remarkable uh, uh, story, I would say, because it involved television. And uh, I try, I have a, a, a daughter of six years, and, and, and my wife and I try to uh, tell her that television is not too good, she shouldn't <laughs> watch too much TV. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I got in contact with chemistry through television. And we had, a, we had a television program, even on, the, on the, uh, uh, one of the big national TV channels, uh, Zweite Deutsche Fernsehen, in, 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 which is located in Mainz, the same city I'm, I'm working now. And, um, and they had a program called Chemistry. And it was broadcasted, I think, at, 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 uh, at 2 p.m. or 4 p.m. in the afternoon. So uh, after school, um, perfect for me to watch, uh, uh, during, especially during holidays. And there was a person doing live experiments and then explaining what is penicillin, what are, what are polymers, how is synthetic rubber made, uh, how did the, 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 the dye stuff industry start, and, and, and all those things, what is a redox reaction. All those fundamentals of chemistry, but explained with, with uh, everyday examples. And I was watching, I was maybe five years old. I was watching it, I was fascinated by chemistry. And so my father, when I, when, I, when I was six years old, I got a, uh, it's called Chemiebaukasten. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so a, a chemistry kit for kids. N nothing dangerous, nothing special, but uh, several chemicals with which you could do reactions. So color changes would occur. Suddenly everything turns dark blue or uh, evolves a gas and you get, you get foam and, and, and things like that. So that always fascinated me in a way. And uh, I knew... It sounds strange, but I knew since that age that I wanted to become a chemist, and uh, I think it was a perfect choice. Okay, thank you very much. I've learned a lot, and it was really a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Eu conversei com o professor Tio Opatz da Johannes Gutenberg Universität na Alemanha, e quem se interessou pode visitar o site do grupo de pesquisa. A gente se vê no próximo bloco de notas.